Today's scripture reading is found in Revelation 14, 12. It reads, here is the patience of the saints. Here are those who keep the commandments of God and the faith of Jesus. May God add his blessings to the reading of his word. I'm not preaching, so don't get worried. <laughs> I, um, I wanted to introduce the, the speaker today because my last name is Sheen and his last name is Gale, so people may not know, but this is my dad who's going to preach this morning, Rocky Gale. So I wanted to introduce him and thank you, Michael, for a great reading of the scripture this morning. I really appreciate it. It was last minute. You're on point. Thank you. So at this time, Pastor Rocky Gale, will you come and preach to us? Let's hope that you can hear me clearly and, and um, that you get exactly what I want to talk about today. Take your Bible and turn to Psalm chapter 25. Psalm chapter 25. And I want you to follow with me, if you would, down to verse 4. You have it there? Raise your hand if you have it, okay? Now listen, I'm going to give you a little something that I believe will really be a blessing for your life, if you can remember this, okay? Show me your ways, O Lord. Teach me your paths and lead me in your truth and teach me, for you are the God of my salvation. Now here's the point. I'm going to show you how to do this, okay? Show me, Lord, you have my heart. Do this. Put your hand on your heart. Show me, Lord, you have my heart. Teach me, Lord, you have my mind. Lead me, Lord, you have my hand. Let's try it again. Show me, Lord, you have what? My heart. Teach me, Lord, you have my mind. And lead me, Lord, here's my hand. Are you with me? Say amen. Okay. I want you to follow this message. This is the most important message I've ever written. And I've written a lot of them in all these years of ministry. Um, the reason why I think it's so important uh, kind of flows out of a conversation I had with three young ladies in Oregon when I was pastoring there. One was 18, 17, and 16. I believe that was her age. And I asked them, do you love warm, smooth, nice sermons, or would you rather hear the Word of God? And you know what they said? What do you think their answer was? We want to know what the Bible has to say. Are you with me? Raise your hand. We want to know what the Word of God has to say. We are living, and I, I do not want to scare our young people this morning, I mean, you come to high school or academy and you're thinking, boy, I have years, I'm going to meet someone. I want to tell you my conviction, we're living at the end of the end. The economy is doing this. Politically, I have never seen in my life such bitterness among Seventh-day Adventists between Democrats and Republicans. Last Sunday was a corn roast. And a friend of mine went to the corn roast in uh, Prescott. And he saw a man wearing a t-shirt that said New Zealand. So he walked over and he said, man, I'll bet New Zealand is a nice place. And the guy replied, well, it's probably a lot better than, than it is here now. We actually give people weapons and tell them to kill. And my brother spoke up and he said, that's not true, brother. Do you know that? These two people, my friend said very little, and the other guy was screaming so loud that people at the cornrows walked by and wondered what was happening. I want to tell you that. That's not rare. What is happening out there in the world is often happening in the church. And our young people do not need to know which side of the political aisle we are on. Would you say amen to that? So why have I put this together? I'll tell you what I do with this. I want you to look, young people. 
I keep it, I'll tell you why I keep it in my Bible. It reminds me of the Adventist movement. Now, I'm going to say something you may not agree with, but I want you to catch, catch this and listen so you hear what I'm saying and don't hear what, and you hear, don't hear what I'm not saying. I don't know if the English vocabulary is right, but here's the point. Right now, we are the Seventh-day Adventist church. Are we? Raise your hand. But listen. The prophet that was sent to this church, that began the foundation message of the church, said there's coming a time, volume four, Bible commentary, 1161, where the majority are going to leave us. We're not the movement of destiny now, we're a church. We're comfortable. Don't stand up front and tell me that I'm a sinner. We're comfortable. We want to hear righteousness by faith, and I'm a righteousness by faith preacher. But my young people, I want to tell you that we are living at the end of the age. There's a couple of guys working on my home, you know. They're, they're really rough. One uh, chews tobacco, and the other one, uh, you know, they tell me how much they drink. Uh, last Friday, I said to them, can I pray that you'll have a, a good weekend? They were leaving for the weekend. And they looked at me and said, can you what? I said, can I pray? Pray? We never. I don't know about prayer. What is it? And I prayed for them. And this big old guy named Joe said, well, I know I'm going to hell. He said, I tell people that I'm going to hell. I said, no, you aren't, Joe. He said, how do you know I'm not going to hell? I said, because I can see it in your eyes. There's a spark of God. The eyes are the window of the soul. Would you say amen to that? Amen. That's why when I, whether I'm in Maverick or Walmart or wherever, I pray with people all the time. Yesterday morning, I prayed with a couple in Cracker Barrel. They had the most beautiful baby. Beautiful baby. How many of you know of jo Dr. George Knight? Have you heard of him? Yeah. He wrote a book, The Neutering of Adventism, meaning that the Adventist church has lost its power. We're no longer a movement. We're a church. We will be a movement when all those people out there come in as the majority leave. Is that sad? Is that sad? The majority of the church is going to leave. Maybe you didn't want to hear that, but I'm telling you why. We are so close to the end of this world that I can see the pulse of God as I look around. Men and women are crying for a relationship with something better than they have. In reality, they're crying for God. Okay, take your, your handout out. I, I want you... When you're done, please keep this, young people. Don't discard this. I'll tell you why. You're going to remember the time that Elder Dale came and spoke because God's going to lead you to somebody, and that somebody's going to be this week. Have it in your Bible. Take it with you. Memorize it. Okay, ten marks of God's people. What separates them from the world? And my uh, thrust this morning is on uh, Revelation 14, okay? Take your Bible very quickly, turn to 2 Peter chapter 1, 2 Peter chapter 1, I want you to follow with me so we can, we can keep this together. You know, I don't like to preach when people fall asleep, and then I have to come up and wake them up, and I don't want to do that. <laughs> 2 Peter chapter 1. I want somebody who's got a strong voice to read it for me. Verse 12, who's going to read it? 2 Peter 1, 12. One of our young people like to read that scripture? Yes, right here. 2 Peter 1, 12. Listen to this. <laughs> ah, does anybody have a King James Bible here? Do you? Aha! <laughs> Go ahead, brother. Give me the scripture for 2 Peter 1, 12 from the King James, would you please? Well, that's a little different. The NIV is a dynamic translation. We've got somebody right here. Right here, guys. Go ahead. Ah, 
be established in what? Present truth. Here's the present truth. Jesus loves you. He gave his life for you. I love that song. Oh, that was a beautiful song. Jesus gave his life for you. For thick and thin. And you know something? There's so much good in the worst of us and so much bad in the best of us. It's hard to know, it's hard to know which one of us ought to convert the rest of us. That's the condition we're in. Be careful how you judge another, okay? Peter says be established in the present truth. Now I'm going to give it to you. Ten identifying marks of God's people. The movement of destiny. Paul told Timothy, the Lord knows those who are his. Okay, let's, let's begin with number one. They have, the first identifying mark is they have the everlasting gospel. Right? Revelation 14, 6. Since the scripture is there, I'll let you follow me along. Revelation 14, 6. And we read. And I saw another angel fly in the midst of heaven, having the everlasting gospel to preach unto them that dwell upon the earth, to every nation, kindred, tongue, and people. And that's interesting because in Revelation 13, 7, the Bible says that Satan was let loose to deceive nation, kindred, tongue. Satan counterfeits everything that God does. Everything. Satan counterfeits it. Listen to the words of Revelation chapter 1, verse 18, and I'll read it to you. I'm the living one, says Christ. I was dead, and behold, I'm alive forevermore, and I hold the, de the keys of death and Hades. All right, how many of you have lost a grandfather or grandmother? Do you long to see them? You don't? Yes. Yes. Uh, my grandmother church, boy, she was a ticket, wasn't she? She was a ticket. She had one tooth right here. And she, she smoked so bad that her hair had a permanent dye, a yellow streak. And this old lady and I, she, my grandfather owned a 300-acre farm in New Hampshire, and I spent year after year with them. In fact, when I was given to my grandfather to watch, I had rickets. The doctor said he may not live, and he put me, Mama put me in a, a shoebox, gave me to Grand and Grandpa Church, and in a month, I moved to an orange crate. You know why? The, my grandfather would take me out to the cow, and fresh milk from the cow, he would squirt it in my mouth. I'll tell you, Grandma was a ticket. She was a ticket. But when I visited her in the hospital, she said, I want you to have my, my funeral. You're going to do a good job. I said, oh, Grandma, I'm going to do a good job. And I want to say something to you. You may have a loved one who is not religious, but they live a better life than some who claim to be religious. Am I right with that? Yes. I think you're going to be amazed at those God raises and those he does not raise. We'll be surprised in heaven. We'll see people we knew should not be there. We'll be surprised. We'll see people in heaven that uh, we, uh, not in heaven, that we knew should be there. And the greatest surprise of all is that we'll be there. Amen? Amen. Amen. I can't wait for the resurrection. My dad and mom are buried on top of a mountain called Gale Hill. Our whole family. Is buried on that mountain, and that's where Rocky's going. But I believe I'm close to seeing Jesus come. I do. I believe it. Revelation 5, 9, the Bible says they sang a new song. You are worthy to take the scroll and open its seals because you purchased men from God with every tribe, language, tongue, and people. And Revelation 14, 6, flying in the midst of heaven with the everlasting gospel. How many angels' messages are in Revelation 14? Three, right? Did you know the devil has a counterfeit for the three angels? Revelation 16, 13, the dragon, the beast, and the false prophet. The false prophet acts like the Holy Spirit, creating an image to the beast. The beast power, and I'm not after a church here, Catholicism. I mean, a dragon, rather, Catholicism. And what is the beast? The beast receives a deadly wound. Ah, that's interesting. 
This whole thing is playing out. Satan has his own spirit. False prophet. God the Father, God the Son, and the Holy Ghost. But what does the gospel do? I'm going to give you three things. We're going to move some through the, some of these very fast. What time am I supposed to be done? Oh, you are very kind. You are very kind, my dear. Thank you very much. The gospel in Revelation brings three things. Number one, it delivers us from the penalty of sin. I am saved, and I don't mind saying that. Can you say amen? I belong to Jesus. <laughs> Think about this. If you die, you're going to meet Jesus in the twinkling of an eye. You're going to see him. Amen? What a Lord. What a wonderful Lord. It gives us victory over the power of sin. We struggle with habits and things our whole life. And you know something? Oh, let me see if I can find it for you here. Uh, let's see here. Oh, listen to this. You see, you've got to mark your Bible up. <laughs> Ellen White says, sanctification is a lifelong work. It's a process because of its very nature. It is never completed in this life. Listen to that. It is, in, it is not the work of a moment, an hour, a day. We are constantly dying to sin and constantly living for Christ. As long as Satan reigns, at least until after the thousand years, we have self to subdue and besetting sins to overcome. So long as time shall last, she says, there will be no stopping place. That means that nobody is perfect in this world. Would you say amen to that? Romans chapter 3, verse 10, there is none righteous, not a one righteous. That's why we're all in the same boat. Don't drill a hole in the boat because you're going to drown too. We're in the same boat. Now listen to this. We shall often have to bow down and weep at the feet of Jesus because of our shortcomings. But we are not cast off, nor are we forsaken by God. Oh, I love that. That's the good news. That's the good news, young people. Number two, let's move right down through these. <laughs> they have a worldwide proclamation. Number two. And again, I'm going to rehearse that, that same uh, thought. You know, the gospel is to go to what? Every nation, kindred, tongue, and people. There it is, Revelation 14, 6. This whole concept of 10 identifying marks is found in Revelation 14. That's the seedbed for it, okay? Revelation chapter 14. Worldwide message. The gospel is to go everywhere. The whole thrust in the New Testament has to do with the gospel being preached to the whole world. And then, then what happens? The end comes. Do you know what they found out? That people in Guam and Saipan, my father was stationed there during World War II, every single one of these river people have a cell phone. Did you know that? They have a cell phone. Everyone from the Philippines on throughout Asia and Europe, overnight this gospel could go like fire. Let me give you a for instance. Let's say you, you get up tomorrow morning, you open your, your cell phone, and there it is, a massive earthquake on the coast of California. And don't, don't mock that because it's going to come. There's a fault line right off the coast of Oregon, California. And you wake up and you say, Mom, what happened to this? A million people died. Do you think, how long do you think it's going to take for this gospel to finish its work? Very quickly, very quickly. Worldwide proclamation. But the problem is uh, that there's um, good and bad. Revelation, Matthew 13 talks about it. And, uh, you know, I'm a, a person who believes in the harvest. Take your Bible and open to Revelation 14, right after the three angels' messages, and pick it up in verse 14 for me. Revelation 14, 14. You see it there? And then I looked, and behold, a cloud, a white cloud. And on the cloud sat one like the Son of Man, having his head on his head a golden crown, and in his hand a sharp sickle. Another came out of the temple, an angel crying with a loud voice to him who sat on the throne, thrust in your sickle and reap, for the harvest of the earth is what? It's ripe. You come right up, that's okay. The harvest of the earth is what? 
That's a direct quote almost from Joel 3.13. The harvest is right. What does that mean? Harvest of wheat and the harvest of tares. Number three, the third identifying mark of God's people. And I make sure I follow my wife, you know. She's not going to be happy with me if I don't. <laughs> Number three. They call upon people to put God what? First. Hold your hand up. How do you put God first? Boy, you're going to remember this, young people. Keep your hand nice and high. F-I-R-S-T. You put God first in your finances. Ooh. You put God first in your interest. Oh, yeah. Whoa. You put God first in your relationships. If I'm going to be connected to some dude that doesn't know Jesus, I'm going to run away. Would you say amen? I'm not going to hang around him. Okay? S, I schedule my time so Jesus comes first. Amen? And T, all the troubles in life that you have are preparing you to go home with Jesus. Amen. 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 You see that? So you put God first in everything. Revelation 1.17 says, And when I saw him, I fell at his feet to worship him. And his, his hand was laid upon me, saying unto me, Fear not, I'm the first and I'm what? I'm the last. Oh, I'm the first and I'm the last. Jesus, Jesus wants first place in your life. Turn to Ezekiel chapter 36. Young people, I want you to see this. Maybe you have a brother. Maybe you have a mother, a dad, or someone else in your family that has walked away from God. Listen to this. Ezekiel chapter 36, and I want you to follow me down to verse 31. Who's going to read it for me? Ezekiel 36, 31. Okay, my brother, right here. Yeah, 36, 31. You see it there? You got it? Oh, well, listen to this. Oh, my. You will remember all the things you did that were wrong. You know? And you say, oh, Lord, I'm sorry. I'm sorry. What did you say, amen? I'm sorry, God. I want to serve you with my whole heart. I want to serve you with my whole heart. There's another text here that's so beautiful. In Jeremiah chapter 31, the Lord said, I will bring back those who have walked away. Is that wonderful? I'll bring them back home. In Exodus chapter 20. And verse 1 and 2, the Lord says, I am the Lord your God who brought you out of the land of Egypt to out of the house of bondage. You shall have no other gods before me. So listen to this. God redeems and then we serve. We are saved to serve. And in our serving, we're never going to be perfect in it. Are you with me? You know, there are two books out. Dr. George Knight has written a new book. And uh, you ought to see if you can get a copy of it. It's a new book. It's beautiful. And uh, let me tell you what changes people's lives, by the way. Follow this, follow this mathematical thing here, okay? CP, say it with me, CP plus CC plus HP equals MI. All right, here it is. You ready for it? Close proximity to lost people, plus clear communication, plus high potency people equals maximum impact. Is this some information you can use, young people? Amen. Amen. Number four, the fourth identifying mark of God's people, they worship him as creator. And here's our text. Revelation 4.11. We read... You are worthy, our Lord, our God, to receive glory and honor and power. You created all things, and by your will they were created and have their being. And then, listen, Revelation 14, 7 again. Worship him that made heaven, earth, sea, and the fountains of water. I was with a minister one time, not of our faith, and he said, well, we keep Sunday, the resurrection day. I said, did you know the Bible says nowhere to keep Sunday? He said, that's not true. 
I showed him how Revelation 14, 7 is almost a direct quote from Exodus 20 and verse 11. He said, well, the church has always kept Sunday. I said, it doesn't mean it's right. Do you know there's a church in Dallas, Texas of 500 people? The pastor called the union this a few years ago and said, we studied the Bible and Saturday's the Sabbath and we want to join the Seventh-day Adventist Church. <laughs> this is happening, my young people. Happening everywhere. I wish I had time to talk to you more in depth about some of these things. All right, let's move now to number five. Oh, while you're there, I want you to remember this. What day of the week was man created on? What day? Six. So we rested before we work. The first full day that Adam and Eve were given was what? The Sabbath. Six days shalt thou labor, but the seventh day is a Sabbath of the Lord thy God. Listen to this. We rest to work righteousness by faith. See, this is why, I'll tell you, young people, when I retired in 2011 as a pastor, I didn't know half of what I know now. Now I talk to people everywhere. You know why most people don't talk to others? Because they're afraid that they won't have an answer. But God will give you the answer. Amen? Okay, I'm going to move through the last part relatively quick. Here it is, number uh, five leads to the identifying mark they announce the time of God's judgment. I want you to see two things here. Listen to this. Listen to the scriptures as they come out here. Saying with a loud voice, fear God, give glory to him for the hour of his judgment is come and worship him that made what? Heavens, earth, sea, and what? I told you this is a judgment hour message. Listen to the next two scriptures of Noah. In the 600th year of Noah's life, in the second month, the 17th day of the month, on that day the what? Funds of the deep. John the Revelator knew what he was talking about. He drew it from Noah's experience. The fountain of the deep were broken up. The windows of heaven opened. And the fountains of the deep and the windows of the heaven were also stopped. And the rain from heaven was restrained. It's a judgment, our message. Judgment, our message. And you know something, young people? You don't mind me saying this, Jan? My daughter, when I was a young pastor, she was afraid of the judgment. And I want to tell you that we presented this judgment in some ways that we have people as though they're in purgatory. Are you with me? Come on now. We are saved to serve. Jesus is not against me. He is what? For me. In fact, if you look at Three points here. Number one, dominion is taken from the little horn power at the end. That's the beast power. And dominion is given to the saints of the Most High. You and I are going to have dominion. We are going to judge angels. I can't wait for Jesus to come. How about you? Raise your hand. Oh, my. Did you know the very last thought you have here will be the first thought you have when you're resurrected? Think about that one. Okay. Number six. They call for separation of false systems of worship. Again, Revelation chapter 14 and verse 8. Here it is. Another angel followed, saying, Babylon is fallen, is fallen, that great city, because she made all nations drink of the wine, of the wrath of fornication. And Revelation 18, 4 says, come out of her, what? My people. Did you know that a lot of our relatives, a lot of our friends who don't worship with us are God's people? And when the majority of us leave, where, who do you think is coming in? They are going to come into this church by the thousands. Why? Because they're the movement of destiny. The church now is a church, but when it shakes, it will be a movement of destiny again. And if you don't catch up with that now, you may find yourself lost at the end. What a time to be living. What a time to be living. Would you say amen to that? What a time to be living. Separation from false system. Revelation 18, 4, come out of her. Number seven, the seventh mark of identity is loyalty to God. Worship him that made. Worship him that made. I love that. I love that. Worship him that made. 
The hour is coming, and now is when true worshipers will worship the Father in what? Spirit and truth, for the Father is seeking such to worship him. Oh, my brothers and sisters, there are people I meet that are so on fire for Jesus. I remember being at a church girls seminar, and there was a whole line of young girls behind me, probably 16 years of age. And they heard me saying amen, and they said, boy, we're glad to have you here. They knew they hadn't seen me. And uh, I saw their Bible all marked up, and I said, is that your dad's Bible? Dad's Bible? That's my Bible. They study all the time. They're God's people. When Daniel was in Babylon, he prayed three times a day toward where? You remember? Toward Jerusalem. You remember that? He prayed three times a day toward Jerusalem. He was physically in Babylon, but his heart was in Jerusalem. Are you with me? His heart was in Jerusalem. And you know what God wants you to do at the end of time? He wants to help your body join your heart. He that is not with me is what? Against me. Sister White made a statement that I find rather interesting. She says, the death of Jesus fully destroyed the hopes of the disciples as if he had not forewarned them. So in the prophecies, the future is open before us as plainly as it was open to the disciples, the words of Christ. The events connected with the close of probation and the work of preparation for the time of trouble are clearly presented. I did not know that until I've studied the last five years, and they're clearly presented. And yet, she says, Satan watches to catch away every impression and she said that the judgment, probation will close and find them wanting. Because, you know why? We try to entertain our children rather than equip them for a lost world. Is, is that right, young people? That's what we've done. Number eight, they keep the commandments of God. And that's kind of a, uh, um, clear, isn't it? John 14, 15, that's a text that's quite popular with Adventists. You love me, keep my commandments. And then here is the patience of the saints and those who keep the commandments of God. Number nine, they have the faith of Jesus. Faith of Jesus. We're not going anywhere without Jesus as our Lord and Savior. Amen. And here's the scriptures. The dragon was enraged with the woman and went awake war with the rest of her seed. Listen to this. Which keep the commandments of God and have what? You know what we do in the Adventist church? We take that scripture and immediately move to Revelation 19.10 for the testimony of Jesus is what? Spirit of prophecy. But I'll tell you, Revelation 14 in verse 12 is interpreting this text. Here it is. Here's the patience of the saints. Here are those that keep the commandments of God and have what? Faith of Jesus. Now, what John was saying is that behind, behind the testimony of Jesus is the spirit of prophecy. The testimony of Jesus. I'm going to give it to you quick. We're almost done. Don't go to sleep on me, please. I don't want you going to sleep. I want you to hear this. Can you prove uh, the gift of prophecy by the Bible? Boy, turn me loose. <laughs> John 3 and verse 31, he who comes from, from above is above all, and he who is of the earth is earthly and speaks of the earth. He who comes from heaven is above all, and what he has seen and heard, he testifies, and no one receives his testimony. The faith of Jesus, testimony of Jesus. Did you know that Ellen White never used Revelation 12, 17 to describe her gift? Dr. Laurendale, years ago at seminary, told me that. He called seminary, uh, the Ellen White estate, and they said no. Okay, the last one, here we are, number 10. He probably thought I'd never get there. Okay, they await the coming of Jesus with what? Patience. And here's that scripture again. And because lawlessness will abound, oh, Matthew 24. Is this relevant, brothers and sisters? The love of many will what? Grow cold. But he who endures to the end shall be saved. And this gospel of the kingdom will be preached to all nations. And then the end shall come. This happened in New York City. A man left his office. And he thought that he would take a shortcut going home through the Central Park. Anybody here from New York at all? You've been there? Okay. So he took a walk through Central Park. 
And as he was walking along, humming to himself, he heard a terrible noise, and he could tell that someone was being attacked. And he heard the screams of a young girl. Help me, please help me. And then he thought immediately, all these thoughts going through his head, should I stop? What if I get killed? Should I really get involved in this? And she, her scream became fainter. So he said, I'm not going to stand by. And he ran over. He wrestled with the guy. And the guy took off. And then behind the tree, he heard, Daddy, is that you? Daddy, is that you? It was his youngest daughter. She would have lost her life. Oh, I don't want to get involved. I, you know, I know Christ is coming, but listen, I, I am comfortable where I am. I really don't want to get involved here. I'm going to do something that maybe they don't do in academy churches. I wonder if you'd like to join me up front so I can pray for you. I want to pray for the Holy Spirit to take your life and transform you so you'll never be the same. I want to invite you to stand. And those of you would like to join me for prayer, I want to invite you to come. Come on up here, young people. I want, I want to pray for the, the bathing of the Holy Spirit in your life. I want to pray for you that God will take you by the hand and the Lord will lead you. And tell that story to your dad and your mom. This is how important I am. Come on. I want to invite you all to come up. Come on up front here so I can pray for you. I want you to come and join me. I know they don't do that much in academy churches maybe. But I want you to come. I want everyone who can, who can walk to come. Please come. And join us here. I want to pray for you. I want to ask God two things. Number one, I want the Lord to tell you how special you are. You are special. I've never seen such a more beautiful group of academy kids. Beautiful, beautiful, handsome, beautiful. I, there's not any child here this morning that is not beautiful. And you belong to God. Would you say amen to that? Amen. You belong to God. You're God's child. You belong to him. Come right here and we'll hold your hands. Come right out over here. Let's circle together right here, okay? And let's join. Let's join hands here. And we're going to pray for the Holy Spirit to rest upon you. Is everyone connected here? Some of you have, have gone through hell in your life. Some of you have gone through hell. I thank you for that song, my dear sister. Oh, that was, that was, my wife would say the same thing. What a beautiful song. And I want to thank Christine for putting these slides together. Um, I want to pray for you. I love you, young people. I'm, you don't want to be lost. You want to be ready to meet Jesus. Take your Bible and make it precious for you. Father God, here we are standing in the need of prayer. Oh, Lord God, just over the mountain in the promised land, there's a city built by God's own hand. Father, I can see over the mountain. You're coming, Lord. I can see the light is starting to shine, Father God. Your, your coming is so near, and I pray for every single young person here this morning, and I pray for every older person here that you will bless them. And Oh, Father God, open our hearts. Oh, Lord Jesus, if I could weep for the church. I don't want anyone lost. I don't want to be lost, Father God. Put your arms around us. Forgive all our iniquities and cleanse us. With the blood of your son, Jesus, we pray in his wonderful name. And the whole church said, amen. amen. God bless you for coming today. <laughs> Thank you very much. <laughs> That's the first time I've received a clap, and I think it's wonderful. <laughs>